Chapter Four of On the Iron at Big Cloud by Frank L. Packard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Four, Spitzer. Spitzer was just naturally born different. Sometimes that sort of thing wears off as one grows older. Sometimes it doesn't. When it doesn't, it is worse than the most virulent disease. It had been virulent with Spitzer for all of his twenty-two years. Spitzer wasn't much to look at, neither was he of much account on the Hill Division. Some men rise to occasions, others don't. As for Spitzer, well, he was a snubby-nosed, peaked-faced, tousled-haired little fellow with washed-out blue eyes that always seemed to carry around an apology in their depths that their owner existed, and this idea was backed up a good bit by Spitzer's voice. Spitzer had a weak voice, and that militated against him. The ordinary voice of the ordinary man on the Hill Division was not weak. It was assertive. Spitzer suffered thereby because everybody crawled over him. Nobody thought anything of Spitzer. They all knew him, of course, that is, those whose duties brought them within the zone of Spitzer's orbit, which was restricted to Big Cloud, or rather to the roundhouse at Big Cloud. Nobody ever gave him credit for courage enough to call his soul his own. Even when it came to payday, he took the check as though it was a mistake and that it really wasn't meant for him. He just dubbed along, doing his work day after day like a faithful dog, only he was a hanged sight less obtrusive. Summed up in a word, Spitzer ranked as a non-entity, physically, mentally, professionally. Of course, he never got ahead. He just kept on sweeping out the roundhouse and puttering around, playing bellboy to every Tom, Dick, and Harry that lifted a finger at him. Year in, year out, he swept and wiped in the roundhouse. As far as seniority went, he was it, but when it came to promotion, he wasn't. Promotion and Spitzer were so obviously, so ostentatiously at variance with each other that no one ever thought of such a thing. When there was a vacancy, others got it. Spitzer saw them move along, firing, driving spare, up to full-fledged regulars on the right-hand side of the cabs, men that had started after he did, but Spitzer still wiped and swept out the roundhouse. Carlton, the super, called him a landmark, and that hit the bull's-eye. Summer, winter, fall, spring, good weather, bad weather, five foot five with his boots on Spitzer, lugging a little tin dinner pail, trudged down the main street in Big Cloud as regular as clockwork, and reported at the roundhouse at precisely the same hour every morning, five minutes of seven. Never a miss, never a slip. Five minutes of seven. The train crews got to setting their watches by him, and the dispatchers wired the meteorological observatory every time their chronometers didn't tally. That is, tally with Spitzer and the meteorological crowd put Spitzer first across the tape every shot. It was just the same at night, only then Spitzer went by the six o'clock whistle. Ten hours a day, Sundays off, sometimes, wiping, sweeping, sweeping, wiping, from his boarding house to the roundhouse in the morning, from the roundhouse to his boarding house at night. That was Spitzer, self-effaced, self-obliterated, innocuous, modest Spitzer. Night times. Spitzer didn't exist. There was no Spitzer. It wasn't expected of him. If anyone had been asked, they would have looked at their amazement. Then no one ever was asked, or asked, which is the same thing the other way. Spitzer was like a tool laid away after the day's work and forgotten absolutely and profoundly until the next morning. No one knew anything about Spitzer after the six o'clock whistle blew. No one knew and cared less. That is, none of the railroad crowd knew. And they, when all is said and done, were Big Cloud. They owned it, ran it, absorbed it, and properly so, since Big Cloud was the divisional point on the Hill Division. In the ineffable perversity of things is the spice and variety of life. Tommy Regan, the master mechanic, was a man not easily jolted, not easily disturbed. He was very short, very broad, with little black eyes and a long, scraggly, drooping-at-the-corners brown moustache. Also, he was blessed with a well-defined, well-nourished paunch, which is a sign irrefutable of contentment, a calm and placid outlook upon life in general and particular, and a freedom from the ills of haste and worry. 
a man with a paunch is a man apart and greatly to be envied even when that paunch as was the case with regan is of irish extraction for then the accompanying touch of celtic temper makes him more like an ordinary cross-grained irritable everyday mortal and less of a temperamental curiosity regan was justly proud of both his paunch and his nationality regan put it the other way his nationality and his paunch that however is a matter for individual decision and the relative importance of things is as one sees it the main thing is that one permitted him to use fiery words on occasion and the other enabled him to preserve ordinarily a much to be commended state of equanimity perversity of all perversities it was spitzer that jolted regan not once more than once and before he got through jolted him so hard that regan hasn't gotten over the wonder of it yet think of it he'd say when the subject is brought up think of it you know spitzer hm? well think of it spitzer and if it's summer he'll mop his beady brow and if it's winter he'll twiddle his thumbs with his fingers laced over his embonpoint which is to say over the lower button of his waistcoat regan's first jolt came to him one morning as after a critical inspection of his pets in the round house big six and eight-wheeled mountain engines he strolled out and leaned against the push bar on the turntable mentally debating the respective merits of rust joint and a straight patch as specifically applied to number 583 that had been run into the shops the day before for repairs a figure emerged from the engine doors at the far end of the roundhouse and came toward him regan's eyes attracted barely glanced in that direction and then went down again in meditation as he kicked a little hole in the cinders with the toe of his boot it was only spitzer when he looked up again spitzer was nearer quite near spitzer had halted before him and was standing there patiently an embarrassed flush on his cheeks wiping his hands nervously on an exceedingly dirty piece of packing which in his abstraction for spitzer was plainly abstracted he had picked up for a piece of waste huh said regan staring at spitzer's hands what are you trying to do black up for a minstrel show spitzer dropped the packing as though it had been a handful of thistles and rubbed his hands up and down the legs of his overalls well regan invited spitzer began to talk rapidly hurriedly that is his lips moved rapidly hurriedly regan listened attentively and with a strained and hopeless expression as he strove to catch a word and hence the drift of spitzer's remarks how he demanded when he saw spitzer was at an end speak out man you won't wake the baby up spitzer began all over again this time he did a little better a dollar twenty-five repeated the master mechanic numbly spitzer brightened visibly and nodded regan stared bewildered and dumbfounded gradually impossible incomprehensible incongruous as it appeared it dawned on him that spitzer even spitzer spitzer was asking for a raise a dollar twenty-five was all regan could repeat over again and the words came away with a gasp spitzer misinterpreting the tone his face grew rueful and full of trouble. He was appalled at his own temerity in broaching the subject in the first place. But now he had overstepped the bounds. He had asked for too much. A dollar twenty, he ventured in timid compromise. Spitzer was getting a dollar fifteen. How long have you been working here? inquired Regan, recovering a little and beginning to get a grip on himself. Four years, said Spitzer faintly. Good Lord! mumbled regan four years a dollar twenty-five hmm? well i don't know i guess we can manage that and then as a new thought suddenly struck him what the blazes would you do with more money hmm? but spitzer only grinned sheepishly as after murmuring his thanks he walked back and disappeared in the roundhouse good lord muttered regan looking after him four years and a dollar and a quarter and spitzer good lord Regan went around more or less dazed all that day. He ordered the patch on 583 when he had definitely decided on the rust joint as the best tonic for the engine's complaint, and he figured out how much one dollar and fifteen cents a day came to for a year, barring Sundays. Then he did the same for a dollar twenty-five as the multiplicand and compared the results. Spitzer's demand was not exorbitant. 
and it wasn't much to upset any man. That was just it. It was Spitzer, and Spitzer wasn't much. Effect, psychological or otherwise, is by no means to be measured by the mere magnitude of the cause. It is the phenomenal and unusual that is to be treated with wholesome respect, and for safe handling requires a double-track block system with the cautionary signals up from start to finish. The master mechanic found it that way anyhow, and he ought to know. He unburdened himself that night after supper to Carleton and a few of the others over at division headquarters, which had been moved upstairs over the station, where the chiefs used to meet regularly each evening for a pipe, with a round of Pedro thrown in to liven things up a bit, Big Cloud not being blessed with many attractions in the amusement line. Carleton grinned. Bad company, he suggested. Hard lot, that of yours over in the roundhouse, Tommy. They're spoiling his manners. Been a long time in coming, but you know the old story of the water and the stone, what? What in blazes would he do with more money? inquired Spence, the chief dispatcher, in unfeigned astonishment. Regan glared disdainfully. He had put precisely the same question to Spitzer himself, but since then he had been brushing up his mathematics. T do with it, he choked. Thirty dollars and eighty cents a year. Hell of a problem, ain't it? Well, you needn't run off your schedule, said Spence a little tartly. You're the one that's making most of the fuss over it. Tell you what, Tommy, remarked Carleton, still grinning. You want to look out for Spitzer from now on. I guess his emancipation has begun. Nothing like a start. Before you go, he'll be running roughshod over the motive power department, including the master mechanic. I give him a raise, said Regan more to himself than aloud. Twas coming to him, what? Four years, and the first time I ever heard a yip out of him. You'll hear more, prophesied Carleton, even if he doesn't talk very loud. Think so said Regan, puckering up his eyes. I do, said Carleton, and Regan did. Not at once, not for several weeks, but in the meantime a change came over Spitzer. He swept and wiped and reported at five minutes of seven every morning, and kept himself just as much in the background, just as much out of everybody's way, just as unobtrusive as he had before, but Spitzer was none the less changed. It began the day after he got his raise. It was an indefinite, elusive, negative sort of a change, not the kind you could lay your hand on and describe it in so many words. Regan tried to, and gave it up. The nearest he came to anything concrete was one day when he came around the tail end of a tender and unexpectedly upon Spitzer. Spitzer was sweeping as usual, but Spitzer was also whistling, which was not usual. Regan, it is true, couldn't puzzle very much out of that, but then Regan had his limitations. Mindful of Carleton's words, Regan kept his eye in a mildly curious kind of a way on the little faded blue-eyed drudge, and as he noticed the first change without being able to define it, he now, after a week or so, noticed a second, with the difference that this time the diagnosis was plainfully obvious. Spitzer's return to Spitzer's normal self. Spitzer stopped, whistling. Regan began to catch Spitzer's eyes fixed on him with a hesitating, irresolute, anxious gaze about every time he entered the roundhouse. And though he didn't quite grasp it, something of the truth came to him. Spitzer was screwing up his courage to the sticking point preparatory to another step onward in his belated march toward emancipation. It was a month to the day from the first interview when Spitzer tackled the master mechanic again, and, as before, out by the tear table in front of the roundhouse, and, if anything, in a manner even more nervous and ill at ease than on the former occasion. He stammered once or twice in an effort to begin, and his effort was utter failure. Regan eyed him in profound distrust. Once in four years wasn't so much, and, after all, even Spitzer, now that the shock was over, might be expected to do that. But after a month, and from Spitzer... Something was wrong. Perhaps Carleton was right. Well, he snapped, you got your raise, ain't you satisfied? Spitzer nodded dumbly. Well, then, what's the matter with you if you're satisfied? exploded the master mechanic. I want to get... The last word trailed off into tremulous, quavering incoherency. You want to get what? growled Regan. 
Don't sputter as though you'd swallowed your teeth. What is it you want to get? Firing, blurted Spitzer after a desperate struggle. Regan gasped for his breath. Spitzer? Spitzer in a cab? He couldn't have heard straight. Say it again, whispered the master mechanic. Firing, repeated Spitzer, with more confidence now that the plunge was taken. Yes, said Regan weakly to himself. That's it. I got it right. Firing. He wants to get firing. I, 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 I can do it, faltered Spitzer. I got to. Eh, what's that? said Regan. You got to. Say, you, Spitzer, what the devil's the matter with you anyway? Spitzer wriggled like a worm on a hook, and his face went the color of a semaphore arm, a deep red one. Spitzer was suffering acutely. Well, well, prodded Regan. Release the air. Take the brakes off. I'm, began Spitzer shamefacedly. I'm, he gulped down his Adam's apple hard twice, and then it came, and with a rush. I'm going to get married to Merla Swenson. Regan's jaw sagged like the broken limb of a tree, and his eyes fairly popped out and hung down over the roll of his cheeks. Then gradually, very gradually, he began to double up, and unhandsome contortions afflicted his facial muscles. Spitzer! Spitzer was enough, but Spitzer and Merla Swenson? Six-foot, heavy-boned, long-armed Swedish maiden Merla! Oh, contrariety, variety, perversity of life! Ha! he roared suddenly. <laughs> and again, only louder. The turner and a helper or two poked their noses out of the roundhouse doors to get a line on the disturbance. Can a stone float? Can a feather sink? Astonishing, bewildering, dumbfounding, impossible, oh yes, but it was all so very funny. It was the funniest thing that Regan had ever heard in his life. Ha 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 he screamed. Ho 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 his paunch shook like jelly, and he held both hands to his sides to ease the pain. He straightened up preparatory to going off into another burst of guffaws, and then, with his mouth already open to begin, he stopped as though he had been stunned. Spitzer was still standing before him, and Spitzer's head was turned away, but Regan caught it and caught the two big tears that rolled slowly down the grimy cheeks, and in that moment he realized what neither he nor any other man on the hill division had ever realized before that spitzer too was human regan coughed choked and cleared his throat here was spitzer in a new light but the spitzer of years was not so readily to be consigned to the background of oblivion spitzer in a cab was as much an anomaly as ever conjugal aspirations to the contrary firing said he with grave consideration that he meant by contrast should serve as palliation for the sting of his mirth firing i am afraid not you're not fit for it you're not big enough spitzer dashed his hands across his eyes i can fire he announced with a surprisingly show of spirit and i got to they're smaller ones than me doing it what do you mean by got to demanded the master mechanic Spitzer shifted uneasily and kicked at the ground. Merle and me's been making up for quite a while, he stammered, but 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 she wouldn't say nothing one way or the other till I got a raise. Well, you got it, said Regan. Spitzer nodded miserably. Yes, and 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 now she says tain't enough to get married on and, and we'll have to wait till I get firing. Good Lord, murmured Regan and he mopped his brow in deep perplexity. The destiny of mortals was in his hands, but so was the motive power department of the Hill Division. He could no more see Spitzer in a cab than he could see the time-honored camel passing through the eye of a needle. Then inspiration came to him. "'Look here, Spitzer,' said he soothingly. "'There ain't any use talking about firing, and I ain't going to let you build up any false hopes. But I'll tell you what. You don't need to feel glum about it. She loves you, don't she? Spitzer's lips moved. Hmm? inquired Regan solicitously, bending forward. Yes, she says she does, repeated Spitzer in thin tones. 
Yes, well, then, when you know women and as much about them as I do, you'll know that nothing else counts, nothing but the love, I mean. It's their nature, and they're all alike. That's the way it is with all of them. Regan waved his hand expansively. It'll be all right, you'll see. She won't hold out on that line. Some men profit much by little experience, others profit little by much experience. Spitzer, possibly, had had little, very little, but the dejected droop of his shoulders as he started back for the roundhouse intimated that in the matter of knowledge as applied to the eternal feminine he was perhaps, in so far as it lay between himself and the master mechanic, the better qualified of the two to speak. And that certainly was concretely applied, which is to say applied to Merla Swenson. Regan couldn't have kept the story back to save his life, and it didn't take long for the division to get it. They all got it, train crews and engine crews on way freights, stray freights, locals, extras and regulars, the staff, the shop hands, the track walkers, and the section gangs down to the last car tink. At first the division looked incredulous, then it grinned, and then it howled, and its howl was the one word, Spitzer with seventeen exclamation points after it to make the tempo and rhythm hang out in a manner befitting and commensurate with the occasion. It's an ill wind that blows nobody good. Dutchy Damrosch did the business of his life. He did more business than he had ever dreamed of doing in his wildest flights of imagination, for Dutchy had the lunch counter rights at Big Cloud. What's that got to do with Spitzer and his marital ambition? Well, a whole lot. Merla Swenson was second girl in Dutchy's establishment, and Merla was the fiancé of Spitzer, which was a rotten bad pun of Spider Kelly's, the conductor, and due more to the brogue-like twist of his tongue than to any malice of forethought. To see any girl that was in love with Spitzer was worth the price of coffee and sinkers any old time. The lunch counter took on the air of a dime museum, and the visitors questioned Merla anxiously, a little suspiciously that after all there might be a nigger in the woodpile somewhere in the shape of a frame-up with the hoax on themselves. Merla settled all doubts on that score. Unruffled, calmly, stoically, dispassionately, she answered the same question fifty times a day and each time in the same way. Yeah, I then love Spitzer, was her infallible reply, in a tone that made the bare possibility that she could have done anything else seem this the very acme of absurdity. Merla's inflection struck deep at the root of things inevitable. After that there was nothing to be said. A few, very few, and as the days went by their numbers thinned with amazing rapidity, had the temerity to snicker audibly. They only did it once as with arms akimbo and hands on hips Merla advanced to the edge of the counter with a look in her steadfast blue eyes that was far from inviting, and inquired, "'Him bad good mans, I thank?' It was put in the form of a question, it is true, but the put was of such cold uncompromise that the result was always the same. The offender hastily buried his nose in his coffee cup, dug for a dime to square his account with Dutchy, and made for the platform." This was all very well, but unless Regan died and someone with a little less or a little more, depending on how you look at it, imagination, took his place, Spitzer's chances of getting into a cab were as good as ever, which is to say that they were about as good as the goodness of a plugged nickel. And the trouble was that as far as Spitzer could see, the master mechanic wasn't sprouting out with any visible signs of premature decay. Furthermore, as he had suspicioned and now discovered, Regan wasn't the last word on women. Not, perhaps, that Merla put firing before love, only she was uncommonly strong on firing. Spitzer was unhappy. All things come to those who wait, they say. So they do, perhaps, but the way of their coming is sometimes not to be understood or fathomed. The story of a man who fell from the eighteenth-story window of an office building and incidentally broke his neck has no place here except in a general way. A friend who took a passing interest in the event was curious enough to investigate the cause, and he traced it back step by step, logically, surely, inevitably, beyond the possibility of refutation, to the fact that the second hook from the top on the back of the man's wife's dress, not the man's dress, the dress of the man's wife, was missing on the morning of the day of his untimely decease. The man, not the man's friend, was an inventor, 
but no matter. It just shows. Regan still being alive, the chances are better than a thousand to one that Spitzer would have known a cold and forlorn old age, as Robert Lewis puts it, and Merla would never have had a second edition of herself if it hadn't been for a few measly, unripe crab apples. What? Yeah, that's, that's it. Crab apples. That's the way Spitzer got where he is today, just crab apples. Funny how things happen sometimes when you come to think of it, isn't it? Spitzer and the man who broke his neck aren't the only ones who've had their ups and downs that way, not by several. There isn't any moral to this except that here and there you'll find a man who isn't as modest about his own ability as he ought to be. Spitzer's nocturnal habits, that were a matter of so much unconcern and of which the railroad crowd at Big Cloud were so densely in ignorance, have a part in this. The truth is that between the lunch counter and the station is the baggage and freight shed, and behind the freight shed it is very dark, and also not less pertinent is the fact that Merla was possessed of no other quarters than those shared by her sister-in-arms in Dutchy's employ, which were neither propitious nor commodious. Hence, but the connection is obvious. On Merla's night off at eight o'clock, Spitzer sneaked down through the fields and across the platform, weather permitting, and on those nights Merla donned her bonnet for a walk at the same hour. When the station clock struck ten, and coincidentally number one's mellow chime sounded down the gorge, Merla retraced her steps to the upstairs rear of the lunch counter, and Spitzer retraced his across the platform to the fields in the direction of the town and his boarding-house. Only of late Spitzer had taken to lingering on the platform way up at the far end where it was also very dark and equally as deserted. Here he would gaze wistfully at the big mogul with valves popping and the steam drumming at her gauges as she waited on the siding just in front of him, Big Cloud being a divisional point where the engines were changed, to back down on to number one for the first stretch of the mountain run, Burke's run with 503 and Big Jim McAloon looking after the shovel end of it. There wasn't anything novel in the sight but it didn't seem to strike Spitzer as monotonous, although when it was all over and he watched the vanishing tail lights, he always sighed. It was just the same performance each time. Ten minutes or so before number one westbound was due, McAloon would run 503 out of the roundhouse, over the turntable, up the line, and back onto the siding. Then Burke would appear on the scene, light a torch, and poke around with a long-spouted oil can. Spitzer would usually reach his position up the platform in time to see the engineer's final jab with the torch between the drivers or into the link motion before swinging himself through the gangway into the cab, as the Limited, with snapping trucks and screeching brake shoes, rolled into the station. But one night it fell out a little differently. The station clock had struck ten, Merla had hastened to her domicile, and Spitzer to the far end of the platform, as usual, but number one was late. Suddenly Spitzer jumped and his heart seemed to shoot into his mouth. There was a wild, piercing scream of agony. It came again. The blood left Spitzer's cheeks. He saw Burke fly around the end of the pilot, the torch dancing in his hand, and make for the cab. Spitzer involuntarily leaped from the platform to the track and ran in the same direction. Then the safety valve popped with a terrific roar, drowning out all other sounds. He clambered cautiously into the cab. On the floor, McAloon was going through a performance that would have beggared the efforts of a writhing python, and the while he groaned and yelled. As Spitzer watched, Burke, who was bending over McAloon with an anxious face, suddenly reached forward and picked up a little round object that rolled from the pocket of the fireman's jumper, then another, and another. Spitzer instinctively craned forward, and in so doing attracted Burke's notice for the first time. Burke's look of anxiety gave way to a grin, and he held out the objects to Spitzer, just as if it wasn't Spitzer at all but an ordinary man. Humor, like death, is a great leveler, but no matter, let that go. Burke held them out to Spitzer, Spitzer took them, and even Spitzer grinned. It didn't need any doctor to diagnose McAloon's complaint, and the complaint wasn't poetic. Cramps, old-fashioned, unadulterated cramps, just plain cramps and green cramp apples. Some things lay a man out worse, perhaps, but there aren't many. Burke's grin didn't last long, for at that moment came number one's long, clear siren note, 
and back over the tender a streak of light shot out in a wide circle from around a butte and then danced along the rails and began to light up the platform as the limited thundered five minutes late into the straight stretch holy fish plates yelled burke i gotta get a man to fire spitzer you run like hell to the roundhouse and burke stopped spitzer stopped him there are moments in everybody's life when they rise above themselves above habit above environment above everything if even for only a brief instant a chance like this would never come again if he could fire one trip maybe regan would change his mind spitzer grasped at it frantically despairingly burke i i, I can fire he fairly screamed give me a chance burke i'll i'll, I'll never get one if you don't burke gasped for a moment like a man with his breath knocked out of him then something like a dry chuckle sounded in his throat no one knows but burke what decided him it might have been either of two things or a combination of them both spitzer's pleading face or the desire to take a rise out of regan burke and regan not having been on the best of terms since the last general elections be that as it may burke pointed at the squirming fireman take his feet he muttered together they lifted and dragged the stricken macaloon out of the cab and to the ground eleven o eight pulling number one had come to a stop abreast of them by now and burke shouted at the engine crew here he bawled lend a hand and as both men stuck their heads out of the gangway he and spitzer boosted the fireman up to them got cramps explained burke tersely you'll be able to fix him up in the roundhouse five minutes late huh well hurry you're clear there's your go-ahead pull out and let me get hold burke turned to spitzer as eleven o eight slipped away from the baggage car and moved up the track and pointed to the gangway of his own engine get in he said grimly you'll get a chance to fire and take it from me you'll never get a chance to do that or anything else again this side of the happy hunting grounds my bucko if you throw me down and while regan quarrelled amiably over a game of pedro upstairs in the station with carleton five o three with spitzer tousle-haired mild-eyed heart beating like a trip hammer spitzer in the cab back down on the imperial limited and coupled on for the mountain run there was a quick testing of the air a hurried running up and down the platform and then burke leaning from the window with his arms stretched out inside the cab and fingers on the throttle opened a notch and the platform began to slide past them spitzer wrinkled his face and stared at the gauge needle two hundred and ten pounds all the way all the time two hundred and ten pounds it was up to him with a jerk of the chain he swung the furnace door wide and a shovelful of coal shot neatly scattered over the grate there is an art in all things there is the quintessence of art in the prosaic and laborious task of firing an engine spitzer was not without art for in a way he had had years of experience but banking a fire in the roundhouse and nursing a roaring pit of flame to its highest degree of efficiency in a swaying lurching cab are two different and distinct operations that are in no way to be confounded 503 began to lurch and sway notch by notch burke was opening her out and the bark of the exhaust was coming like the quick crackle of a gatling five minutes late in the mountains on a time schedule already marked up to a dizzy height that called for more chances than the passengers paid for is well it's five minutes just five minutes that's all some men would have left it for the pacific division crowd the next day on a level track and a straight sweep but not burke spitzer's initiation was in ample form and he got the full benefit of all the rites and ceremonies with every detail of the ritual worked in and no favors shown so far all was well the rough country was all in front of the pilot and spitzer was all business his pulse was beating in tune to only one thing the dancing needle on the gauge again he swung the door open and the red flare lighted up the heavens and played on features that regan would never have known for spitzer's they were set grim and determined covered with little sweat beads that glistened like diamonds the singing sweep of the wind was in his ears and he poised his shovel there was a sickening slur five o three shot round a tangent and the shovel full of coal shot like bullets all over the cab including burke hit about everything in sight but the objective point aimed at simultaneously spitzer promptly performed a gyration that resembled something like a back handspring and landed well up on the tender to roll back to the floor of the cab again with an accompanying avalanche of coal 
he picked himself up and glanced apprehensively at the engineer there was not a scowl not even a grin on burke's face just an encouraging flirt of the hand but the flirt was momentous wise and full of guile was burke for with that little act spitzer biblically speaking girded up his loins and got his second wind they were well into the foothills now and the right-of-way was an amazing wonder diving twisting curving it circled and bored and trestled its way and buttes canyons gorges and coulees roared past like flights of fancy the speed was terrific to spitzer it was all a wild mad medley of things he had never known before of things that had neither beginning nor ending the giddy slew as the big mountain racer hit the curves the crunching grind of the flanges as for an instant she lifted from her wheel base the pitch the roll the staggering reel the gasp for breath the beat of the trucks the whir of the racing drivers the rush of the wind the echoing thunder of the flying coaches behind it was all there all separate all welded into one a creation new vernal life the life of the rail that beat at his eardrums and quickened the pounding throb of his heart at first from time to time burke leaned over his levers to glance at the pressure gauge but after a bit he crouched a little further forward in his seat and his eyes held on the track ahead where the beam of the electric headlight flooded the glittering ribbons of steel he was getting what uh, macaloon or no other man had ever given him before two hundred and ten pounds all the way spitzer was firing number one the imperial limited westbound on the mountain run three minutes late the sweat was rolling in streams from the little fellow now and he clung in the gangway for a moment's breathing spell leaning out staring ahead at a few shining lights in the distance came the hoarse scream of the whistle the clattering crash as they shattered the yard switches a blurred vision of dark outlines dotted with tiny scintillating points and station yard lights switches and all were behind him spitzer drew his sleeve across his forehead and turned again to his work as they thundered over a long steel trestle thief creek spitzer knew the road well enough at second hand if not from personal experience just ahead was the pass sucker pass straight enough for its quarter-mile stretch but where the rock walls rose up either side so close as to almost scratch the paint off the rolling stock eased for a moment in scant deference to switches and trestle just past spitzer felt the forward leap of the racer as burke threw her wide open again he bent for his shovel and then, quick as the winking of an eye, sudden as doom, came a tearing, rending crash, a scream from Burke, and the right-hand side of the cab seemed literally torn in two. A flying piece of woodwork that struck him across the eyes, a terrific jolt as the engine lifted and fell back, sent Spitzer headlong to the floor of the cab. Dazed, half-mad with the pain, the blood streaming from his forehead, he staggered to his feet. Burke lay coiled in an inert heap just in front of him by the furnace door. A whizzing piece of steel rose up, crunched, slithered, gashed a track of ruin for itself, and was gone. It had missed Burke only by a hair's breadth. Next time there might not be even that limit of safety. With a cry, Spitzer leaped forward and dragged the unconscious engineer across the cab. Again the jolt, the slur, the stagger, the desperate wrench. It seemed like years, like eternity to Spitzer. He was living a lifetime in the passing of a second. It had been no more than that, no more than two or three at most. There are some things worse, much worse in railroading than a broken crank pin and a rod a muck, but not when it comes in the pass, where derailment at their racing speed spelt death, quick and sudden. There was just one chance for the trailing string of coaches, just one for every last soul aboard, Spitzer. But between Spitzer and the throttle and the air latch was a thing of steel that rose and fell, now swinging a splintering, murderous arc through the shattered side of the cab, now grinding into the ties and roadbed, threatening with every revolution to pitch 503 and the train behind her headlong from the rails to crumple like flimsy eggshells against the narrow rocky walls that lined the pass. Just one chance for the train crew and passengers, just one in a thousand for Spitzer and little five-foot-five Spitzer, diffident, retiring, self-effaced, unobtrusive Spitzer, with a dry, choking sob in his throat, flung himself forward to stop the train. 
His hands clutched desperately at the levers. There was a hiss, the vicious bite of the brake shoes, then a blinding light before his eyes as the rod caught him and he pitched, senseless, half out through the front window of the cab, head down on the running board. The last word is a woman's. It is her inalienable right, said Merla to Regan, with a world of suggestion in the cadence of her voice, when Spitzer was getting well enough to think about going to work again. I ban love, Spitzer. Well, said Regan, squinting at her round, steadfast blue eyes, there ain't anything I know of to keep you waiting. He can name any run he wants. And then, the wonder of it still being heavy upon him, he exclaimed with the air of one invoking the universe, Now wouldn't that get you? What do you think, huh? All English to Merla was literal. In bent good mans, I thank, she said. End of chapter 4《On the Iron at Big Cloud》by Frank L. Packard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 5 Shanley's Luck. Generally speaking, Carleton, the super, was a pretty good judge of human nature, and he wasn't in the habit of making many breaks when it came to sizing up a man. Not many. He did sometimes, but not often. However, Shanley came out from the East, third-class, colonist coach, billed through to Bubble Creek, B.C. Not that Shanley had any relatives or friends there, nor, for that matter, any particular reason for wanting to go there. It was simply a question of how far his money would go in yards of pink-colored paper, about two and one-half inches wide, stamped, printed, countersigned, and signed again to obviate any possible misunderstanding that might arise touching the company's liability for baggage, the act of God, dangers foreseen and unforeseen, personal effects or resultant personal defects, whether due to negligence or not, it was all one. The colonist ticket was a bill of lading, and the goods went through O.R., owner's risk. This possibly may not be strictly legal, but it is strictly safe for the company. Furthermore, the directors didn't have to sit up very late at night to figure out that if they got the colonists' money first, there would be none left for legal advice in case of eventualities, and that's the way it was with about 999 out of every thousand colonists. The company, of course, did take some risk. They took a chance on the one-thousandth man. The company had sporting blood. If Shanley had only known what was going to happen, he could have saved some of his money on that ticket. As it stands now, he has still got transportation coming to him from Little Dance on the Hill Division to Bubble Creek, B.C. That may be an asset, or it may not. Shanley never asked for it. Third class, colonist, no stopover allowed, red-haired, freckle-faced, an up-tilt to the nose, a jaw as square as the side of a house, shoulders like a bull's, and a fist that would fell an ox. That was Shanley. That was Shanley until the sprung rail that ditched the train at Little Dance caused him the loss of two things, his erstwhile status in the general passenger agent's department and a well-beloved and reeking briar. Both were lost forever, his status partly on account of the reasons before mentioned and partly because Shanley wasn't particularly interested in Bubble Creek his briar because it became a part, an integral part, of that memorable wreck as Shanley, who was peacefully smoking in the front-end compartment of the colonist coach when the trouble happened, left the pipe behind while he catapulted through the open door. It was summer and sizzling hot, and landed a very much dazed, bewildered, but not otherwise hurt Shanley, halfway up the embankment on the off-side of a scene of most amazing disorder. The potentialities that lie in a sprung rail are something to marvel at. Up ahead the engine had promptly turned turtle, and as promptly giving vent to its displeasure at the indignity heaped upon it, had encased itself in an angry hissing cloud of steam. Behind, the baggage and mail cars seemed to have vied with each other in affectionate regard for the tender. Only the brass-polished nickel-plated Pullmans at the rear still held the rails, the rest was just a crazy slew, edgeways up, canted, toppled over string of cars. 
already beginning to smoke as the flames licked into them. The shouts of those who had made their escape, the screams of those still imprisoned within the wreckage, the sight of others crawling through the doors and windows brought Shanley back to his senses. He rose to his feet, blinked furiously, as was his habit on all untoward occasions, and the next instant he was down the embankment and into the game, to begin his career as a railroad man. That's where he started, in the wreck at Little Dance. In and out of the blazing pyre, after a woman or a child, the crash of his axe through splintering woodwork, the scorching heat, prying away some poor devil wedged down beneath the debris, tinkling glass as the heat cracked the windows or he beat through a pane with his fist. It was all hazy, all a dream to Shanley, as hours afterward, a grim, gaunt figure with blackened, bleeding face, his clothes hanging in ribbons, he rode into the big cloud yards on the derrick car. Some men would have hit up the claim agent for a stake. Shanley hit up Carleton for a job. But for modesty's sake, previous to presenting himself before the superintendent's desk, he borrowed from one of the wrecking crew the only available article of wearing apparel at hand, a very dirty and disreputable pair of overalls. Dirty and disreputable, but whole. "'I want a job, Mr. Carlton,' said he bluntly, when he had gained admittance to the super. "'You do, hmm?' replied Carlton, looking him up and down. "'You do, eh?' "'You're a pretty hard-looking nut, hmm?' Shanley blinked, but being painfully aware that he undoubtedly did look all, if not more than that, and being, too, not quite sure what to make of the super, he contented himself with a remark, "'I ain't a pitcher, I suppose.' Hmm, said Carleton. "'Been up at the wreck, I hear. What?' "'Yes,' said Shanley shortly. "'No long story, no tale of what he'd done, no anything, just yes.' And that was what caught Carlton. "'What can you do?' demanded the super. "'Anything. I'm not fussy,' replied Shanley. "'Hmm,' said Carlton. "'You don't look it.' And he favored Shanley with another prolonged stare. Shanley, at first uncomfortable, shifted nervously from one foot to the other. Then, as the stare continued, he began to get irritated. "'Look here,' he flung out suddenly. I ain't on exhibition. I come for a job. I ain't got any letters of recommendation from pastors or churches in the East. I ain't got nothing. My name's Shanley, and I haven't got anything to prove that. You've got your nerve, said Carleton, leaning back in his swivel chair and tucking a thumb in the armhole of his vest. Ever worked on a railroad? No, answered Shanley, a little less assertively, as he saw his chances of a job vanishing into thin air and already regretting his hasty speech. A few odd nickels wasn't a very big stake for a man starting out in a new country, and that represented the sum total of Shanley's worldly wealth. No, I, I never worked on a railroad. Hmm, continued Carlton. Well, my friend, you can report to the trainmaster in the morning, and tell him I said to put you on breaking. Get out. It came so suddenly and unexpectedly that it took Shanley's breath. Carlton's ways were not Shanley's ways, or ways that Shanley by any peradventure had been accustomed to. A moment before he wouldn't have exchanged one of his nickels for his chances of a job. Therefore his reply resolved itself into a sheepish grin. Moreover, but of this hereafter, Shanley back east was decidedly more in the habit of having his applications refused with scant ceremony than he was to receiving favorable consideration which was another reason for his failure to rise to the occasion with the appropriate words of thanks. Incidentally, Shanley, like a select few of his fellow creatures, had his failings, concretely his particular strayings from the straight and narrow, not having been hidden under a bushel, were responsible with the advice and assistance of a distant relative or two, advice being always cheap, and assistance, in this case a marked-down bargain, for his migration to the West, as far west as the funds in hand would take him, Bubble Creek, B.C. The distant relatives saw to that. They bought the ticket. Shanley, still smiling sheepishly and in obedience to the super's instruction to get out, was halfway to the door when Carlton halted him. Shanley. Yes, sir, said Shanley, finding his voice and swinging around. Got any money? Shanley's hand mechanically drove through the overalls and rummaged in the pocket of his torn and ribboned trousers. 
the pocket had not been spared, the nickels, every last one of them, were gone. The look on his face evidently needed no interpretation. Carleton was holding out two bills, two tens. Cleaned out, eh? Well, I wouldn't blame anyone if they asked you for your board bill in advance. Here, I guess you'll need this. You can pay it back later on. There's a fellow keeps a clothing store up the street that it wouldn't do you any harm to visit, hmm? With gratitude in his heart and the best of resolutions exuding from every pore, he was always long on resolutions, Shanley, being embarrassed and therefore awkward, made a somewhat ungraceful exit from the super's presence. But neither gratitude nor resolution, even of steel plate, double riveted variety, are of much avail against circumstances and conditions over which one has absolutely, undeniably, and emphatically no control. If Dinkelman's clothing emporium had occupied a site between the station and McGuire's Blazing Star Saloon, instead of the said Blazing Star Saloon occupying that altogether inappropriate position itself, and if Spider Kelly, the conductor of the wrecked train, had not run into Shanley before he had fairly got ten yards from the super's office, things undoubtedly would have been very different. Shanley took that view of it afterward, and certainly he was justified. It is on record that he had no hand in the laying out of Big Cloud nor in the control of its real estate rentals or leases. Railroad men are by no stretch of the imagination to be regarded as hero worshippers, but if a man does a decent thing, they are not averse to telling him so. Shanley had done several very decent things at the wreck. Spider Kelly invited him into the Blazing Star. Shanley demurred. I've got to get some clothes, he explained. Get them afterward, said Kelly. Plenty of time. Come on, it's just supper time, and there'll be a lot of the boys in there. They'll be glad to meet you. If you're hungry, you'll find the best free layout on the division. There's nothing small about McGuire. Shanley hesitated, and proverbially was lost. An intimate and particular description of the events of that night are on no account to be written. They would not have shocked, surprised, or astonished Shanley's distant relatives, but everybody is not a distant relative. Shanley remembered it in spots, only in spots. He fought and whipped Spider Kelly, who was a much bigger man than himself, and thereby cemented an undying friendship. He partook of the hospitality showered upon him and returned it with a lavish hand, as long as Carleton's twenty lasted. He made speeches, many of them, touching wrecks and the nature of wrecks and his own particular participation therein, which was seemly, since at the end, about three o'clock in the morning, he slid with some dignity under the table, and with the fond belief that he was once more clutching an axe and doing heroic and noble service, wound his arms grimly, remorselessly, tenaciously, like an octopus, around the table leg, and slept. McGuire, before bolting the front door, studied the situation carefully and left him there, for the sake of the table. The sunlight next morning was not charitable to Shanley. Where yesterday he had borne the marks of one wreck, he now bore the marks of two, his own on top of the company's. Up the street, Dinkelman's clothing emporium flaunted a canvas sign announcing unusual bargains in men's apparel. This seemed to Shanley an unkindly act that would be expressed in no better terms than rubbing it in. He gazed at the sign with an aggrieved expression on his face, blinked furiously and started with a step that lacked something of assurance for the railroad yards and the trainmaster's office. He was by no means confident of the reception that awaited him. If there is one characteristic over and above any other that is common to human nature, it is the faculty, though that's rather an imposing word, of worrying like sin over something that may happen, but never does. Shanley might just as well have saved himself the mental worry anent the trainmaster's possible attitude. He did not report to the trainmaster that morning, never saw that gentleman until long, very long afterward. Instead, he reported to Carleton, at the latter's urgent solicitation in the shape of a grinning call boy who intercepted his march of progress toward the station. "'Hey, you, there, cherub face!' bawled the urchin politely. "'The super wants you, on the hop!' Shanley stopped short and, resorting to his favorite habit, blinked. "'Carlton, get it, Carlton!' repeated the messenger, evidently by no means sure that he was thoroughly understood. 
and then for a parting shot as he sailed gaily up the street, "'Gee, but you're pretty!' Carlton. Shanley had forgotten all about Carlton for the moment. His hand instinctively went into his pocket, and then he groaned. He remembered Carlton, but worst of all he remembered Carlton's twenty. There were two courses open to him. He could sneak out of town with all possible modesty and dispatch, or he could face the music. Not that Shanley debated the question. The occasion has never yet arisen when he hadn't faced the music. He simply experienced the temptation to crawl. That was all. It looks to me, he ruminated ruefully, as though I was up against it for fair. Just my luck, just my blasted luck. Always the same kind of luck, that's what. It ain't my fault, neither, is it? I ain't responsible for that darn wreck. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here. And Kelly, Spider, he said his name was. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here neither. What the blazes did I have to do with it? I always have to stand for the other cuss. That's me every time, I guess. And that's logic. It was. Neither was there any flaw in it, as at first sight might appear, for the last test of logic is its power of conviction. Shanley, from being a man with some reasonable cause for qualms of conscience, became in his own mind one deeply sinned against, one injured and crushed down by the load of others he was forced to bear. He explained this to Carlton while the thought of his burning wrongs was still at white heat and before the super had a chance to get in a word. He began as he opened the office door, continued as he crossed the room, and finished as he stood before the super's desk. The scowl that had settled on Carlton's face as he looked up at the other's entrance gradually gave way to a hint of humor lurking around the corners of his mouth, and he leaned back in his chair and listened with an exaggerated air of profound attention. "'Just so, just so,' said he, when Shanley finally came to a breathless halt. Now, perhaps you'll allow me to say a word. It may not have occurred to you that I sent for you in order that I might do the talking, hmm? This really seemed to require no answer, so Shanley made none. Yesterday, went on Carlton, you came to me for a job, and I gave you one, didn't I? Yes, admitted Shanley, licking his lips. Just so, said Carlton mildly. I hired you then, I fire you now. Pretty quick work, what? "'You are the doctor,' said Shanley, evenly enough. He had, for all his logic, expected no more nor less. He was too firm a believer in his own particular and exclusive brand of luck. "'You are the doctor,' he repeated. "'There's a matter of twenty bucks.' "'I was coming to that,' interrupted Carlton. "'But I'm glad you mentioned it. "'I'll be honest enough to admit I hardly expected you would.' A man who acts as you've acted doesn't generally, hmm? Uh, I told you it wasn't my fault, said Shanley stubbornly. Carlton reached for his pipe and struck a match, surveying Shanley the while with a gaze that was half perplexed, half quizzical. You're a queer card, he remarked at last. Why don't you cut out the booze? It wasn't my fault, I tell you, persisted Shanley. You're a pretty good hand with your fists, what? said Carlton, irrelevantly. Kelly's no slouch himself. Shanley blinked. It appeared that the super was as intimately posted on the events of the preceding evening as he was himself. The remark suggested an inspection of the fists in question. They were grimy and dirty, and most of the knuckles were barked. Closed, they resembled a pair of miniature battering rams. Yeah, pretty good, he admitted modestly. Hmm. About that twenty, you intend to pay it back, don't you? I'm not a thief, whatever else I am, snapped Shanley. Of course I'll pay it back. You needn't worry. When, insisted Carlton coolly, well, when I get a job. I'll give you one, said Carlton. Royal Carlton, the boys called him, the squarest man that ever held down a division. I'll give you one where your fist will be kept out of mischief and where you can't hit the high joints quite as hard as you did last night. But I want you to understand this, Shanley, and understand it good and plenty, and once for all, it's your last chance. You made a fool of yourself last night, but you acted like a man yesterday. That's why you're getting a new deal. 
You're going up to Glacier Canyon with McCann on the construction work. You won't find it anyways luxurious, and maybe you'll like McCann, and maybe you won't. He's been squealing for a white man to live with. You can help him boss Italians at uh, 175 a day, and you can go up on 29 this morning, and that'll take care of your transportation. What do you say? Shanley couldn't say anything. He looked at the super and blinked. Then he looked at his fist speculatively and blinked. Carlton was scribbling on a piece of paper. All right, hmm, he said, looking up and handing over the paper. There's an order on Dinkelman. Only get someone else to show you the way this time and take the other side of the street going up. Understand? Uh, Mr. Carlton, Shanley blurted out, if ever I get full again, you... I will, said Carlton grimly. I'll fire you so hard and fast you'll be out of breath for a month. Don't make any mistake about that. No man gets more than two chances with me. The next time you get drunk will finish your railroad career for keeps. I promise you that. Yes, said Shanley humbly. And then, after a moment's nervous hesitation, uh, about Kelly, Mr. Carlton, I, I don't want to get him in bad on this. Uh, you see, it was this way. He left early. That's what started the fight. I, I called him a, a quitter or something like that. Mm, yes, or something like that, repeated Carlton dryly. So I believe. I've had a talk with Kelly. You needn't let the incomprehensible workings of that conscience of yours prick you any on his account. Kelly knows when to stop. His record is okay in this office. Kelly doesn't get drunk. If he did, he'd be fired just as fast as you will be if it ever happens again. If I'm never fired for anything but that exclaimed shanley in a burst of fervent emotion i've got a job for life i'll prove it to you mr carlton i'm going to make good you see if i don't very well said carlton i hope you will that's all shanley i'll let mccann know you're coming shanley's second exit from the super's presence was different from the first he walked out with a firm tread and squared shoulders he was rejuvenated and buoyant he was on his mettle, quite another matter, entirely another matter, and distinctly apart from the paltry consideration of a mere job. He had told Carleton that he would make good. Well, he would. And he did. Carleton himself said so, and Carleton wasn't in the habit of making many breaks when it came to sizing up a man. Not many. He did sometimes, but not often. Shanley did not take the other side of the street on the way to Dinkelman's, by no means. He deliberately passed as close to the Blazing Star Saloon as he could, passed with contemptuous disregard, passed boastfully in the knowledge of his own strength. A 1600-class engine with her four pairs of 46-inch drivers can pull countless cars up a mountain grade steep enough to make one dizzy. But Shanley would have backed himself to win against her in a tug-of-war over the scant few inches that separated him from McGuire's dispensary as he brushed by. None of McGuire's for him. Not at all. Red-headed, freckle-faced, barked-knuckled, bulwarked, and armor-cased against temptation. Shanley dealt that morning with Mr. Dinkelman, purveyor of bargains in men's apparel. The dealings were liberal on the part of both men, on Shanley's part because he needed much, on Mr. Dinkelman's part because it was Mr. Dinkelman's business and his nature to sell much, if he could, safely. This was eminently safe. Carlton's name in the mountains stood higher than guaranteed gilt-edged gold bonds any time. The business finally concluded. Shanley boarded 29, local freight, west, and in due time, well on in the afternoon, rigorously sober, straight as a string, cleaned, groomed, and resplendent in a new suit, swung off from the caboose at Glacier Canyon, as the train considerately slackened speed enough to give him a fighting chance for life and limb. He landed safely, however, in the midst of a jabbering Italian labor gang, who received his sudden advent with patience and some awe. A short, squinting-faced man greeted him with a grin. "'My name's McCann,' said he of the squint face. "'This is Glacier Canyon, for what you see of it. "'Them's the Italians. "'Yon's for where I roost, and by the same token for where you'll roost too from now on. "'Above is the shack of the men. "'I is pleased with your introduction. "'Tis van hell of a hole you've come to. "'Shanley's the name, eh? "'A good one, and I'm proud to make the acquaintance.' 
Shanley blinked as he stretched out his hand and made friends with his superior, and blinked again as he looked first one way and then another in an effort to follow and absorb the other's graphic description of the surroundings. The road foreman's summary was beyond dispute. Glacier Canyon was as wild a piece of track as the Hill Division boasted, which was going some. The right-of-way hugged the bald gray rock of the mountains that rose up at one side in a sheer sweep, and the trains crawled along for all the world like huge flies at the base of a wall. On the other side was the Glacier River, with its treacherous sandy bed that had been the subject of more reports and engineers' gray hairs than all the rest of the system put together. The construction camp lay just to the east of the canyon and at the foot of a long, stiff, two-mile, four-percent grade. That was the reason the camp was there, that grade. Locking the stable door when the horse is gone is a procedure that is very old. It did not originate with the directors of the Transcontinental. They never claimed it did. But their fixed policy, if properly presented before a court of arbitration, would have gone a long way toward establishing a clear title to it. If they had built a switchback at the foot of the grade in the first place, extra number 83, when she lost control of herself near the bottom coming down, would have demonstrated just as clearly the necessity for one being there as she demonstrated most forcibly what would happen when there wasn't. All of which is by way of saying that rock or no rock, expense or no expense, the door was now to be locked, and McCann and his men were there to lock it. McCann explained this to Shanley as he walked him around, up the track to the men's shanties, over the work, and back again down the track to inspect the interior of the dwelling they were to share in common. A relic of deceased extra number 83 in the shape of a truckless boxcar with dinted and bulging sides, dinted one side and bulged the other, that is. But, uh, said Shanley, I don't know what a switchback is. Who expected it of you? inquired McCann. And what difference does it make? Carlton sent word you were green. You've no need to know. So as you can do as you're told and make them geezers do as they're told and can play 45 at night, that's the point, the main point with me, and it's me you have to get along with to be all right. Since Megan, him that was helping me, took sick a week back, I've been alone. Begad, playing solitaire is... I can play 45, said Shanley. McCann's face brightened. The powers be praised, he exclaimed. I'll enlighten you then on the matter of switchbacks, me son, so as you'll have an intelligent conception of the work. A switchback is a bit of a spur track that sticks out like the quills of a porcupine at intervals on a bad grade such as the one for an instie. Tis run off the main line, do you mind, and up contrarywise to the dip of the grade. When a train coming down gets beyond control and so expresses herself by means of her whistle, she's switched off and given a chance to run uphill by way of variety until she stops. And the same holds true if she breaks loose going up. Is it clear? It is, said Shanley. When do I begin work? In the morning. It is near six now, and the boys will be quitting for the night. Forty-five is a grand game. We'll play it out tonight to our better acquaintance. I contend is the national game of the old sod. Whether McCann's contention is borne out by fact or by the even more weighty consideration of public opinion is of little importance. Shanley played 45 with McCann that night and for many nights thereafter. He lost a figure or two off the paycheck that was to come, but he won the golden opinion of the little road boss, which ethically, and in this case practically, was of far greater value. "'He's a bright jewel of a lad,' wrote McCann across the foot of a weekly report. And Carleton, seeing it, was much gratified, for Carleton wasn't in the habit of making many breaks when it came to sizing up a man. Not many. He did sometimes, but not often. Shanley was making good. Carleton was much gratified. Of the three weeks that followed Shanley's advent to Glacier Canyon, this story has little to do in a detailed way. But as a whole, those three weeks are pointed, eloquent, and important. Very important. Italian laborers have many failings, but likewise they have many virtues. They are simple, demonstrative, and their capacity for adoration of both men and things is very great. From Jacco, the water boy, to Pietro Maraschino, the padrone, they adored Shanley 
and enthroned him as an idol in their hearts for the very simple reason that Shanley, not being a professional slave driver by trade, established new and heretofore undreamed of relations with them. Shanley was very green, very ignorant, very inexperienced. He treated them like human beings. That was the long and short of it. Shanley became popular beyond the popularity of any man before or since who was ever called upon to handle the foreign element on the Hill Division. And the work progressed. Day by day the cut bored deeper into the stubborn mountainside. Day by day the glacier river girdled peacefully along over its treacherous sandy bed, one of the prettiest scenic effects on the system, so pretty that the company used it in the magazines. Day by day regulars and extras, freights and passengers, east and west, snorted up and down the grade, the only visitations from the outside world. Night after night Shanley played forty-five with McCann in the smoky, truckless boxcar. Also the camp was dry, very dry, drier than a sanatorium, that is, than some sanatoriums, Carleton had been quite right. There was no opportunity for Shanley to hit the high joints quite as hard as he had that night in Big Cloud. There was no opportunity for him to hit the high joints at all. Shanley had not seen a bottle for three weeks. Therefore Shanley felt virtuous, which was proper. Some events follow others as the natural, logical outcome and conclusion of preceding ones. Others, again, are apparently irrelevant and the connection is not to be explained either by logic, conclusion, or otherwise. Rain, McCann's departure for Big Cloud, and Pietro Maraschino's birthday are an example of this. When it settles down for a storm in the mountains, it is, if the elements are really in earnest, torrential and prolonged, and has the effect of tying up construction work tighter than a Supreme Court injunction could come anywhere near doing it. McCann had business in Big Cloud, whether personal or pertaining to the company is of no consequence, and the day the storm set in, the morning having demonstrated that its classification was not to be considered as transient, he seized the opportunity to flag the afternoon freight eastbound. This was natural and logical, and an opportunity not to be neglected. That this day, however, should be the anniversary of the day the padrone's mother of blessed memory had given birth to Pietro Maraschino in sunny Naples fifty-three years before, is, though apparently irrelevant, far from being so. And since its peculiar and coincident happening cannot be laid at the door of either logical, natural, scientific, or philosophical conclusions, and since it demands an explanation of some sort, it must perforce be attributed to the metaphysical, which is a name given to all things about which nobody knows anything. "'Is I in charge?' said McCann grandiloquently, waving his hand to Shanley as he swung into the caboose. "'Is I in charge of the work, me son. See it out. I trust you.' As the work at the moment was entirely at a standstill and bid fair to remain so until McCann's return on the morrow, this was very good of McCann. But all men like words of appreciation, most of them whether they deserve them or not, so Shanley went back into the boxcar out of the rain to ponder over the tribute McCann had paid him, and to ponder too over the new responsibility that had fallen to his lot. He did not ponder very long. Indeed, the freight that was transporting McCann could hardly have been out of sight over the summit of the grade when a knock at the door was followed by the entrance of the dripping figure of the padrone. Shanley looked up anxiously. "'Oh, uh, Pietro,' he said nervously, for the weather wasn't the kind that would bring a man out for nothing, and he was keenly alive to that new responsibility. "'Hello, Pietro,' he repeated. "'Anything wrong?' Pietro grinned amiably, shook his head, unbuttoned his coat, and held out a bottle. Shanley stared in amazement and then began to blink furiously. "'Here!' Said he, what's this? Chianti, said Pietro, grinning harder than ever. Chianti. Shanley screwed up his face. What the devil is Chianti? Very good the wine from Italia, said the beaming Patrone. Is it? Is it? Well, it's against the rules, asserted Shanley with conviction. It's against the rules. McCann would skin you alive, he would. Where'd you get it? Oh, what's up, huh? It's against the rules. I'm in charge. Pietro explained. It was his birthday. It was very bad weather. 
for the rest of the afternoon there would be no work. They would celebrate the birthday. Mr. McCann had taken the train. As for the wine, Pietro shrugged his shoulders. His people adored wine. Unless they were very poor, his people would have had a little wine in their packs, perhaps. He was not quite sure where they had got it, but it was very thoughtful of them to remember his birthday. Each had presented him with a little wine. This bottle was an expression of their very great good esteem of Mr. Shanley. Perhaps later Mr. Shanley would come himself to the shack. "'That's against the rules,' blinked Shanley. "'McCann would skin you alive. Maybe I'll drop in by and by. You can leave the bottle.' Pietro bobbed, grinned delightedly, handed over the bottle, and backed out into the storm. Shanley, still blinking, placed the bottle on the table and gazed at it thoughtfully for a few minutes, and his thoughts were of Carlton. If, if to a whiskey, said he, I'd have no part of it, not a drop, not even a smell. I would not. I would not touch it. But uh, as it is, uh... Shanley uncorked the bottle. Not at all. One does not get drunk on a bottle of Chianti wine. A single bottle of Chianti wine is very little. That is the trouble. It is very little. After three weeks of abstinence, it is very little indeed, so little that it is positively tantalizing. The afternoon waned rapidly, and so did the Chianti. Outside, the storm, instead of abating, grew worse, the thunder racketing through the mountains, the lightning cutting jagged streaks in the black sky, the rain coming down in sheets that set the culverts and sluiceways running full. It was settling down for a bad night in the mountains, which in the Rockies is not a thing to be ignored. "'Tis no wonder McCann found it lonely," muttered Shanley, as he squeezed the last drop from the bottle. "'Tis very lonely indeed." He held the bottle upside down to make sure that it was thoroughly drained. "'Most uncommon lonely. It is that. Maybe those Italians be thinking I'm stuck up, perhaps, which I am not. It's a queer name that stuff has, though it's against the rules, and I can't get my tongue around it, but I've tasted worse. For the sake of courtesy, I'll, I'll look in on the birthday party. He encased himself in a pair of McCann's rubber boots, put on McCann's rubber coat, and started out. And to think, said he, as he sloshed and buffeted his way up the two hundred yards of track to the construction shanties, to think that Pietro came out in cruel bad weather like this, all for to present his compliments and ask me over. "'Twould be ungenerous to refuse the invitation. Besides, my presence will keep them in due bounds and restraint. I've heard that I Italians, being foreigners, do not practice restraint. But being foreigners, tis not to be held against them. I'm in charge, and I'll see to it. They greeted him in the largest of the three bunkhouses. They greeted him heartily, sincerely, uproariously, and with fervor. They were unfeignedly glad to see him, and if he had not been by nature a modest man, he would have understood that his popularity was above the popularity ever before accorded to a boss. Likewise, their hospitality was without stint. If there was ever any shortage of stock, which is a matter decidedly open to question, they denied themselves that Shanley might not feel the pinch. Shanley was lifted from the mere plane of man. He became a king. A little Chianti is a little. Much Chianti is to be reckoned with and on no account to be despised. Shanley not only became a king, he became regally, imperially, royally, and majestically drunk. Also there came at last an end to the Chianti, at which stage of the proceedings Shanley, with extravagant dignity and appropriate words, an exhortation on restraint, waddled to the door to take his departure. It was very dark outside, very dark, except when an intermittent flash of lightning made momentary daylight. Pietro Maraschino offered Shanley one of the many lanterns that in honor of the festive occasion they had commandeered, without regard to color, from the toolboxes, and had strung around the shack. Further, he offered to see Shanley on his way. The offer of assistance touched Shanley. It touched him wrong. It implied a more or less acute condition of disability, which he repudiated with a hurt expression on his face and forceful words on his tongue. He refused it, 
and being aggrieved, refused also the lantern Pietro held out to him. He chose one for himself instead, the one nearest to his hand. That this was red made no difference. Blue, white, red, green, or purple, it was all one to Shanley. His fuddled brain did not differentiate. A light was a light. That was all there was to that. A short distance from the shanty door to the right away, Shanley negotiated with finesse and aplomb, and then he started down the track. This, however, was another matter. Railroad ties at best do not make the smoothest walking in the world, and to accomplish the feat under some conditions is decidedly worthy of note. Shanley's performance beggars the English language. There is no metaphor. For every ten feet he moved forward, he covered twenty in laterals, and considering that the laterals were limited to the paltry four feet eight and one-half inches that made the gauge of the rails, the feat was incontestably more than worthy of mere note. It was something to wonder at. He clung grimly to the lantern, with the result that the gyrations of that little red light in the darkness would have put to shame an expert's exhibition with a luminous dumbbell. The while Shanley spoke earnestly to himself. "'Question is, am I drunk, Ash?' The question, if I'm drunk, I lose my job. That's what Carlton said, lose my job. If I'm not drunk, it's all right. Wish I knew whether I was drunk or not. He relapsed into silent communion and debate. This lasted for a very long period, during which, marvelous to relate, he had not only reached a point opposite his boxcar domicile, but being oblivious of that fact had kept on along the track. Progress, however, was becoming more and more difficult. Shanley was assuming a position that might be likened somewhat to the letter C, owing to the fact that the force of gravity seemed to be exerting an undue influence on his head. Shanley was coming to earth. As a result of his communion with himself, he began to talk again, and his words suggested that he had suspicions of the truth. "'Just my luck,' said he bitterly. "'Just my luck. All is some kind of luck. What would I have to do with Pito Mara Mars Mar, Marcino's birthday? Nothing. Nothing at all. It wasn't my fault. Just my luck. Just my—' Shanley came to earth. Also his head came into contact with the unyielding steel of the left-hand rail— and as a result he sprawled inertly full across the right-of-way, not ten yards west of where the glacier river swings in to crowd the track close up against the mountain base. Providence sometimes looks after those who are unable to look after themselves. By the law of probabilities, the lantern should have met disaster quick and absolute. But instead, when it fell from Shanley's hand, it landed right side up, just outside the rail between two ties, and apart from a momentary and hesitant flicker incident to the jolt, burned on serenely. And it was still burning when, five minutes later, above the swish of leaping waters from the Glacier River, now a chattering angry stream with swollen banks, above the moan of the wind and the roll of the thunder through the mountains, above the pelting splash of the steady rain, came the hoarse scream of Number One's whistle on the grade. Sanderson, in the cab, caught the red against him on the right of way ahead and whistled insistently for the track. This having no effect, he grunted, latched in the throttle, and applied the air. The ray of the headlight crept along between the rails, hovered over a black object beside the lantern, passed on again, and held not on the glistening rain-wet rails. They had disappeared, but on a crumbling roadbed and a dark blotch of waters. As with a final screech from the grinding brake shoes, number one came to a standstill. "'Holy MacCheeser!' exclaimed Sanderson as he swung from the cab. He made his way along past the drivers to where the pilot's nose was inquisitively poked against the lantern, picked up the lantern, and bent over Shanley. "'Holy MacCheeser!' he exclaimed again, straightening up after a moment's hesitation. "'Holy MacCheeser! What's wrong, Sandy?' snapped a voice behind him, the voice of Kelly, Spider Kelly, the conductor who had hurried forward to investigate the unscheduled stop. "'Search me,' replied Sanderson. "'Looks like the glacier was up to her old tricks. There's a washout ahead, and a bad one, I guess, but the meaning of this here is one beyond me. The fellow was curled up on the track just as you see him with a light burning alongside. That's what saved it. But 
He's as drunk as the Lord. As Kelly bent over the prostrate form, others of the train crew appeared on the scene. One glance he gave at Shanley's never under any circumstances to be forgotten homely countenance, and hastily ordered the men to go forward and investigate the washout ahead. Then he turned to the engineer. This man is not drunk, Sandy, said he. He is gloriously and magnificently drunk, Kelly, replied the engineer. What would he be doing here, then? He is not drunk. Sleeping it off, he is disgracefully drunk. Can ye not see the bash on his head where he must have stumbled in the dark trying to save the train and struck against the rail? He is not drunk. Can ye not smell, retorted Sanderson. He is dead drunk. I have fought with him, and he licked me. He is a man and a friend of mine. Kelly shoved his lantern into Sanderson's face. He is not drunk. He is not drunk, said Sanderson. He is a hero. What will we do with him? We'll carry him, you and me, over to the construction shanty. It's only a few yards. And put him in his bunk. He works here, you know. McCann's in Big Cloud, for I saw him there. After that, we'll run back to the bend for orders and make our report. Hurry, then, said the engineer. Take his legs. What are you laughing at? I was thinking of Carlton. Carlton? What, what's Carlton got to do with it? I'll tell you later when we get to the bend. Come on. Hmm, said Sanderson, as they staggered with their burden over to the boxcar shack. I have an idea that bash on his head is more dirt than hurt. He's making a speech, ain't he? Just my luck, mumbled the reviving Shanley dolefully. Just my luck. Oh, it's same kind of luck. Possibly said Kelly. Set him down and slide back the door. That's right. In with him now. We haven't got time to make him very comfortable, but I guess he'll do. I can fix him up better at the bend than I can here. Uh, uh, at the bend? What, what do you mean? demanded Sanderson. You'll see, replied Kelly with a grin. You'll see. And Sanderson saw. So did Carlton, in a way. Kelly's report, when they got to the bend, was a work of art. He disposed of the nature and extent of the washout in ten brief, well-chosen words, but the operator got a cramp before Kelly was through covering Shanley with glory. The passengers, packed in the little waiting room, clamoring for details, yelled deliriously as he read the message aloud and promptly took up a collection, a very generous collection, because all collections are generous at psychological moments, that is to say if not delayed too long to allow a recovery from hysteria. At Big Cloud, the dispatcher, because the washout was a serious matter that not only threatened to tie up traffic, but was tying it up, sent a hurry call to Carlton's house that brought the super on the run to the office. By the time the collection had been counted and the total wired in as an additional detail, $140.33, the odd change being a contribution from a Swede in the colonist coach who could not speak English and who paid because a man in uniform, a brakeman acting as canvasser, made the request. A Swede has a great respect for a uniform. Hmm, said Carlton when he had read it all. I know a man when I see one. Tell Shanley to report here. I guess we can find something better for him to do than Boston laborers. What? Yes. Send the letter up on the construction train. One hundred and forty thirty-three, hmm? Tell him that, too. He'll feel good when he sees it in the morning. But Shanley did not feel good when he saw it in the morning, for he was nursing a very bad headache and a stomach that had a tendency to squeamishness. The letter was lying on the floor, where someone had considerately chucked it in without disturbing him. His eyes fell on it as he struggled out of his bunk. He picked it up, opened it, read it, and blinked, his face set with a very blank and bewildered expression. He read it again and again once more. Then he went to the door and looked out. A construction train was on the line a little below him, and a gang of men, not his nor Pietro Maraschino's men, were busily at work. As he gazed, his face puckered. The problem that had so obsessed him on his return journey from the birthday celebration the night before was a problem no longer. "'I was drunk,' said he with conviction. "'I must have been.' He went back to the letter and studied it again, scratching his head. Something, he muttered, has happened. What it is, I don't know. I was drunk and I'm not fired. 
I was drunk and I'm promoted. I was drunk and I'm paid well for it, very well. I was drunk and, and I'll keep my mouth shut. Which was exactly the advice Kelly took pains to give him half an hour later when Number One crawled down to the canyon and halted for a few minutes opposite the dismantled boxcar while the construction train put the last few touches to its work. End of chapter 5 Shanley's Luck <laughs>